section, oh, thank you. This section goes over um, how much your genes contribute to your personality. Um, and the, uh, the genes, if you've taken biology, which all of you should have had some biology by now, you know there's genes are made of DNA. And some of the things uh, that you do, you are born with. And in psychology, we refer to the aspects of your personality and the aspects of your, of your thinking and your, your actions that you're born with is your nature. And then the aspects of your personality that you learn over time is known as, do you know? Nature versus nurture. nurture. This is what you learn. <coughs> so there's kind of been an argument by psychologists over the couple hundred years that it, psychology has existed. How much of your personality are you born with versus how much do you learn? It used to be thought of that the baby is a blank slate and that they learn everything. That's the nurture side. And then studies have shown that no, people are born with a lot of things. We know you are born with reflexes, and uh, there are some things that you can do immediately from birth. A baby, if you put your finger over its hand, the baby will latch onto it. It knows how to do that. It doesn't have to learn how to do it. It just knows how to do it. It has certain reflexes. It'll turn its head toward a noise. A baby will suck if you put something on its lip. It'll reach toward it and start sucking on it. Uh, that's how they know how to breastfeed. And so uh, a lot of it, you're, some of it, you are born with. So there's kind of been an argument over time, which is more. And, mo and more and more research is being done on this. Go ahead and write down a guess what you think the percentages are. If it's 80%, 20%, or 60%, 40%, or 50-50, or 100 and 0. What do you think it is? Get right down to guess, and I'll tell you what they've discovered that it is, that this percentage is, doing a meta-analysis of all the studies out there on whether learning is more nature or nurture. Go ahead and write it down. Have you written down a guess? Go ahead and guess. There's, it seems to be there's a right answer to this. Temperament, that's a word you need to know, a new word. Disposition to respond to the environment is in certain ways. Present in infancy and assumed to be innate or inborn. There's a, um, a couple different types of uh, temperaments. Um, one is a reactive temperament. A child who is reactive is um, one that's uh, uh, very extreme. Highly reactive infants, even at four months of age, are excitable, nervous, and fearful. They overreact to any little thing, even a colorful picture placed in front of them. As toddlers, they tend to be wary and fearful of new things. Toys that make noise, odd-looking robots, even when their moms are right there with them. Five years of age, many of these children are still timid and un uncomfortable in new situations. Seven years, many have symptoms of, of anxiety. They are afraid of being kidnapped. They need to sleep with the lights on. They're afraid of sleeping in an unfamiliar house even if they have never experienced any sort of trauma in their lives. Does this describe any of you as kids? Or maybe kids you've babysat or seen? We call those highly reactive kids. They have what, what's called a reactive temperament. And they think about 20% of kids are reactive children. So um, if we have 20 people in this class, and about 20% of kids are reactive, that means that's about four of us. I think I might have been reactive. Um, they, parents say I was pretty hard to believe. Mm -hmm. So, how do we figure out what percentage of your 
of your behavior and personality is nature and what percent is nurture. Well, one way of figuring it out is to study identical twins. <coughs> now, identical twins have the same DNA. Now, you two probably have similar personalities. How much of that is due to your genes being the same? And how much is it due to y'all being raised in the same household in the same way? What they can do is they can find identical twins like y'all, but those that have been separated since birth. There are about 70 pairs of twins that they know about out there that were born identical twins, and they were separated at birth given away for adoption, you see. And one family adopted this twin, and one family adopted that twin. And then they grew up. And a lot of times they didn't even know about each other. But sometimes they came back together, you see, and they met each other again many years later. And then you could test their personality. They have the same DNA. But if this one behaves a lot differently than this one, has a totally different personality, you see, that would say that it's maybe more nurture than it is nature. But if they were still the same personality, even though one was raised in a real poor household somewhere and one was, got all the best things in the world, they still have the same personality, then nature probably plays a bigger part, you see. The book talks about these two firemen that are on the bottom of page 53. Uh, Gerald and Mark, Gerald Levy and Mark Newman, who were Identical twins separated from birth. Do I have a picture of them here? There they are. <laughs> and they, they lived just uh, uh, 40, 50 miles away from one another, and one day they met and they figured it out. And uh, so they were part of this study that was done. Um, both are volunteer firefighters. Both like to hunt, eat Chinese food, and watch John Wayne movies. They drink beer of the same brand, with their hands held the same way. I want to show you a little video about them, and then we'll go on with this. Wait a minute, are you guys? If I can get it to run. Go to the top, the top the, screen. The, uh, it's a little square on the top of the edge. How do I make this fit? I got you. Double click, double click. No, it's that one down there. Until he was 32, Mark Newman had no reason to suspect that his life story would be of any interest to science. He was adopted and raised in a middle-class family in New Jersey. As a child, he young and loved the great outdoors. Perhaps the lure of adventure inspired him to become a fireman. away, another fireman makes his rounds. Jerry Levy also loves firefighting, but he and Mark Newman have something else in common. Reunited after 32 years, they now know they are identical twins. My parents had told me I was adopted. You know, they weren't my natural parents, so maybe it was some more family out there, but I really didn't think that much about it. Fine. That's what happened. I wasn't concerned about finding my real parents or if I had any, you know, natural relatives, brothers or sisters, it didn't bother me, but in the back of my mind, it was, you know, I always felt like there was something missing out of my life. When I met my brother, uh, that empty feeling I had had, it was gone immediately. And a little piece in the back of my mind said that there's something missing in my life. 
It was Phil. The fact that he's, that we're both firemen is a little spooky. We do have a saying though that you know, firemen aren't made. A fireman is born. So it's only natural. We're twins. We're identical twins. We're both firemen. We're born to be firemen. Jerry and Mark are identical twins because they inherited identical genes. Their story challenges long-held notions about heredity. <clears throat> At the University of Minnesota, twins are helping scientists understand just how genes make us who we are. Hi, Judy and Jill. Hi. How are you doing? Good. Good. Uh, welcome to the lab. Thank you. Now, the first thing we want to do uh, is to get some... Judy Greer and Jill Freeman will undergo six days of testing that will include an extensive physical examination and a complete personality survey. Can I measure your weight? Keep going. <laughs> that light weight. Yeah, that looks about right. It's not surprising that on nearly every kind of physical test, their scores match. Starting to work up a sweat? Yeah. <laughs> what is intriguing is their psychological closeness. Good afternoon. Normally, this would be attributed to a common family life. But even twins separated at birth often share the same mannerisms and style of dress, the same dreams and phobias. These uncanny similarities pique the interest of psychologist Thomas Bouchard. Well, if somebody had come to me uh, 10, 12 years ago, before I initiated this study and started examining these twins, and told me the results we have now, I wouldn't have believed it. Uh, my expectations were that uh, there, there are more hills and valleys uh, than there are flatlands. By that I mean that I thought a good number of traits were largely environmental in origin, shaped by the family and the idiosyncratic environments that we experience, and that other traits are largely biological or genetic in influence. But our findings suggest that uh, there's a kind of pervasive genetic influence that uh, manifests itself in every kind of character we measure. No, actually, one time I remember we were playing charades, and um, uh, they put us on the same team, and uh, I stood up and I read my, my, my little clue, and I yelled out, Rocky and Bullwinkle. <laughs> she hadn't done one thing. Yeah, one thing. <laughs> she just thought about it really hard. Yeah. It was really spooky. The psychological profiles of twins are so close, they have forced scientists to accept the influence of genes on personality. Traits like leadership and shyness are largely inherited. Creativity, aggressiveness, and orderliness seem to be shaped by genes as much as by environment. And to some degree, genes produce extroverts and conformists. We know virtually nothing about how you get from a gene to behavior. Uh, our study says genes must be important, and therefore we should look at biological mechanisms. Uh, but boy, we really know very, very little about those mechanisms. Twins offer us rare insight into the influence of genes on human behavior. They also confirm that genes determine the many traits that make each of us unique. Genes have endowed this child with red hair, blue eyes, and a mind of her own. But what is a gene? The answer lies hidden beyond the scope of the game. Alright, then it starts going into more about genetics. And let's see. We won't worry about that part. Psychologists have worked a long time to compute what they call the heritability of traits. Heritability means what percentage of a trait is due to nature and what percentage is due to nurture. And heritability is always expressed as a decimal form. So 0.0, .0 heritability is nothing. No no, if, if you said that for a certain trait there's zero heritability 
um, genetically, that means it's completely determined by your environment. Um, and it, so it goes, it's, all, it's between zero and one. One is perfectly heritable. That means it's completely due to the environment or completely due to genes. So usually you find a trait between the two. You know, it might have 0.4 heritability. Uh, usually they'll put two decimal points. Um, and uh, there are ways of testing to figure this sort of thing out. Um, they find that, uh, hey, by the way, you guys, when you did that, um, when you did the, uh, the, the test on, uh, um, what was the test we just took um, on the computer? Personality one. The personality, were y'all scores close yeah. to one another? Did you compare yeah. them? Were they like right on or were they? they I mean, they were right on, but they were, yes. they were close. Okay. Um, the, uh, how many, uh, what did y'all, what did y'all guess for this? Let's just go around the room. What was your percentage for nature? 40. 40? 15. Uh, 30. 45. 80. 30. 30. What did you say? 15? 50. 40. 35. 35. 35. 70 for heritability. 70 for, for nature? Yes. Okay. 90? 90. <coughs> 40. 70. 40. 80. Interesting. We're all over the place. The answer, they, they're finding out through lots of studies. Now, different traits are different things. You know, some traits are, are lower and some traits are higher. But they find out it's about, the heritability is about 0.50 for all, everything combined. About 50% of... Your behavior, um, the way you act, the way you think is due to your genes, and about 50% is due to how you were raised, your environment, which is what the next reading section is over. And I have a mistake on the syllabus that you need to fix. Um, over the weekend, you're supposed to read 51 through 59, not 51 through 55, okay? You read about nature and nurture. Over, over the weekend. So that's what the next section goes into is the influence of the environment. The nurture part is 55 <coughs> to 59. And so you have several things that influence you in the environment. Can you think of anything in the environment that influences you? Weather. Influences your behavior, influences Weather. the way you think? What's that? Weather. The weather, okay, let's just call that the environment, environmental, environmental, um, uh, abiotic factors, like the weather, how cold it is, how hot it is, that sort of thing. What else? Like your parents. Your parents. Food. Good. What else? Okay, when you're talking about your home life, are you talking about your parents, how your parents treat you at home? Uh, no. Your friends. Your friends. Your, your teachers. Your pets. Okay. <laughs> Think about that. That's, that's some influences, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, experiences, experiences with people, experiences. Get, if someone gets traumatized in some way, I'm pretty sure they're going to be a little bit different. Like maybe they were kidnapped while the other one was not. Okay, we'll just put experiences. Good. Tortured. Okay. Yeah. Past experiences. I just adopted this. Child. Yeah. Supposed to be checked out by now. Oh really? Yeah. All right. Adios. See ya. Basketball. So what's that for? Oh, basketball players. Anyone? Any other uh, basketball players in here? Yeah. Okay. Good luck. Well. Where y'all going? Oh, Are we getting you that Georgia Tech scholarship? Trinity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um. Let's take a couple of aspects here. Let's just take these three. Let's get rid of the pets, <coughs> past experiences, and environmental abiotic effects.
which of those three, write this down in your book, which of those three do you think is the most important in determining your behavior? Oh, uh, Mr. Will. Don't yell it out. Just write it down. Write your guess. It's a multiple choice question. Like, okay, like when you're younger, I would think it'd be parents, but when you get older and you kind of, you know, don't really want to listen to your parents. Yeah, J.D., uh, can you listen to the instructor? What about your teachers? Are they important? Mm -hmm. I put that. Yeah. Overall, let's say overall, after you're, after you're all grown up, you're 40 years old, you look back on everything. What was the most important aspect in determining the way you think, the way you act, your personality? What's the greatest influence on personality? There is a correct answer here. Write it down. Write down your guess, A, B, or C. You got to write it down. Of those three, it's been studied. And here's a way to study it. You take your um, your parents and you <coughs> let them do a personality test. And you compare it to a personality test that you do. Is your personality more similar to that of your parents or to that of your friends or to that of your teachers? Isn't that kind of biased though because you're only getting the nature part from your like you, you don't get nurture from your parents? <laughs> no, I'm saying like the, no. your friends, you're not going to get the, no, like the credibility part. Well, so that would favor your parents a little more, wouldn't it? I'm confused yeah. what you're saying. You're right, it is a little biased. Are you saying like people that you're most similar to or people that shape you the most? Uh, both. It, it, tur it turns out the sa there's the same answer for both of those questions. Yeah, I know you mean teachers, like school, school yeah. teachers, but could you also mean like mentors, like? Uh, yeah, I guess you could. Right. Teacher could be a mentor, a figure, an adult figure that you happen to like, maybe Boy Scout leader or uh, or pastor or something like that. Yeah. Okay, well the answer is this. It turns out that overwhelmingly, it doesn't matter how your parents raise you. And it doesn't matter what your teachers say, your friends are the number one influence on your life. Oh, I love and that. people tend to tend to uh, share in common personality traits with their friends and tend to be more influenced by their friends than by their parents or teachers. And a lot of studies have shown this. And it talks in the book about how important that is. So when, you, when you're a parent, remember this. There's probably a reason why your parents get really mad when you bring home an undesirable boyfriend or girlfriend, or if you're hanging out running with the wrong crowd. There's, there's a reason for that. The reason is your parents understand how influential they are on you. If you hang out with a group of people that like to study a lot, you probably end up doing better in school and studying more. If you hang out with a group of people who commit a lot of crimes, you're probably a lot more likely to commit crimes, no matter what your parents are doing or your teachers. So surround yourself with friends that are of high character, and you'll probably some of that will probably run off. Now, since I'm telling you to do that, you probably aren't going to listen anyway. So that's the that's the oh what was the that? other form of this is you don't listen to your teachers very much. Sure that's was. okay. What's that? What was second after your friends? Uh, parents. Did you have to put that in your safe spot? At the So, uh, I want you to make sure to read, uh, read about parents and peers. It, it tells about some of the studies. Um, this uh, social cognitive learning school. Social cognitive uh, means, social means interactions. Have you ever heard of social science? You know, it's, it's talking about a science of interactions between people. Cognitive means brain. So social cognitive learning theory talks about how interactions influence your brain. And that's basically what this nurture is a lot about. And it's mostly interactions with other people. 
And that's why I kind of uh, threw out the things about uh, about the environment and the, and the pets and, um, and past experiences, which I guess if they're experiences with other people, um, that would count. But um, uh, ooh, here's an interesting experiment. You want to see the Bobo doll experiment? experiment on learning of, of aggressive styles of uh, behavior uh, through modeling. Uh, children uh, watched a, uh, a, a filmed adult uh, perform novel aggressive acts toward a uh, inflated doll and the physical aggression was um, accompanied by uh, novel uh, hostile uh, uh, remarks. We later measured how much of this uh, modeled aggression uh, the children had learned uh, just by uh, watching. Now the measurement uh, of uh, learning of aggression uh, uses uh, simulated targets rather than uh, live ones. The uh, model pummeled the doll with a mallet, flung it in the air, kicked it repeatedly, Threw it down and beat it. widely believed that seeing others event aggression would drain the viewer's aggressive drive. As you can see, exposure to aggressive modeling is hardly cathartic. Exposure to aggressive modeling increased attraction to guns, even though it was never modeled. Guns had less appeal to children who had no exposure to the aggressive modeling. The children also picked up the novel hostile language. children could choose to play aggressively or non-aggressively. Children in the control group who had no exposure to the aggressive modeling never exhibited the novel forms of aggression. And here's a creative embellishment. A doll becomes a weapon of assault.
the kind of the, the application of that was kind of greater than the actual impact. But uh, that was an interesting experiment, and they talk about it in the reading the, the Bobo doll experiment. That was what the doll was called. I want to show you to talk more about Freud.